Hello, design students. We're starting a project about line. I think I would like to point out that it's an element so often used it's almost ubiquitous. This word means everywhere, almost unseeable because it's everywhere. So what is line? Technically, there are a lot of characteristics to it, but it is actually a path that's made by a moving point. Um, and in geometry, it only really has length to it. But of course, we know when we work with pens, pencils, ink, and such, that lines have thickness to them as well. So it's a visual element of length, and it's basically created by setting a point in motion. It has a lot of different qualities to it. You say, well, only physical, no, but even digitally, if I drew a line, that would be on the mouse or something. So there's a lot of different mediums you can draw a line with. There, part of um, its characteristics are that they're often in relationship to each other, right? So you have to have some kind of orientation for it to work to have parallel to parallel to what? Well, you're going to be working on paper mostly, so parallel would be to the edges of the page, right? Perpendicular to the edge of the to the edge of the page as well. And then within the page, there's things like converging, intersecting, different types of lines. So lines are always in relationship to the environment around them, what they're being drawn on, and the page. Okay, just important to note that. So when we're talking about it, we want to orient it to the paper or the environment. That's um, that's one thing I want to talk about. The other thing is there's types of lines. They have a quality to them, right? Vertical, diagonal, these are horizontal. These are in relationship to the page. Straight lines, wavy, scallop, zigzag, curly, curve. These are all sort of the quality of the line. Okay? So there's sort of the orientation of it on the page, and then there's the quality. What do we mean by line quality? It's... It's kind of, there's more to it than just one particular thing. There's thickness and thinness. There's all this type of stuff. Well, we kind of want to talk about it in terms of how it's relating to other things. So you can tell a vertical line really well by a horizontal line or a thick line when there's a lot of thin lines. Wavy lines show up really well with straight lines, right? So they're contrast to each other. And some of it's to do with the medium you use, right? These are pretty much very similar type of shapes, but made with like a pen or pencil and ink with a brush. So line quality is determined by the medium. And then how thick and thin the line is, how you push on the page, the pressure you use. This is made by Heinrich Clay. It's actually a printmaking piece from etching an etched metal plate that's put through the press so it has a different quality because of that but you get how much ink is actually shown by how thick the line is right so the value and density of it is part of it as well so there's a lot of different types of line um actual line is the most obvious it's the most actual um, it's a series of connected points that's continuous, basically, as, you're, as it's moving along. And it is what it seems to be. It's actually there. It's not hiding itself. It could be in black and white, simple, or color. This one has tones in it as well. But it's actual. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Just another example. Picasso. You know, these are all actual lines. They're fully there. Thick and thin lines. You're going to do a project if you looked at the project sheet. So lines in a piece, if you want them to appear really thin, you have to have thicker lines next to them. And so thickness and thinness is all relative to what's around it, right? If you had really, really, really minute lines, then this would be thick. But you need to just pay attention when you're doing your project um, on this about the difference between them, highlighting difference. This is a good example of this piece about a clown character uh, seated, and he's using the thick lines to sort of define the, the clothing and the chair, and then thinner lines to give like a nuance to the face and the mask. So it's used in a conceptual way, but also to give um, solidity to the piece and bring focal points.
another example of his thickness and thinness. The thickness brings out this like feline cat jaguar type of character that's underneath the person riding the horse. The warrior. Wavy and angular. Again, line qualities. What is wavy and angular? Well, we could think of angular especially by being something that has like 90 degree angles for sure, but there's of course other type of angles. Um, as far as it doesn't have to be 90 degrees, but geometric is angular, and then wavy is more free association type of lines, right? So in this piece, not a perfect example, but things are getting kind of wavy here. I think if I was going to use this as my um, drawing, my design to show it, I would want more angles, even more things that were angular. This kind of shows you a little bit of it. It's a pretty bad picture, actually. I need to improve this. <laughs> we'll maybe make it smaller. You can see it better. So there's some kind of angular lines and then waviness. Not totally working super well. So I'll show you some more examples of student work that's a little bit clearer. But the main point that I want to show you right now is that angular would be anything that's very geometric doesn't have to be at 90 degrees and wavy is things that have a quality of wave not just meandering but actually waviness is like sound waves going on they they go back to the same point like a wave in the ocean right meandering and straight is the next style that you're going to want to show and this is done with thread by an artist that I like and these are the meandering lines they kind of meander around like a road going through a mountain in straight lines a little more obvious when you see the difference between straight angular type of lines these are a good example of angular and meandering type of lines like a continuous contour drawing if you've ever taken drawing classes where you don't lift your pen off or pencil off the page when you're doing it. So that would be a great way to get a meandering style line. And have it, you don't lift your pencil. You're just kind of working through the whole thing. It's meandering around, trying to save the form. So when you're designing something, you need to do this. You're going to have to think about what type of subjects, or you could be abstract. I don't mind abstract work. It gets the idea across, right? Versus, if I was doing this in an angular way, you get the idea, I think. So there's a difference between the two in that way. Okay. These are examples of meandering. I like this because it shows like um, mountain tops, how they develop contour over the earth. Um, so contour lines are another way to think about meandering. Just more examples like um, architecture is very straight, gridded, and then you could do some stuff with people. That's a pretty interesting way to think about it. Of course, you're doing drawings, not photography, but it gives you the same idea for it. So, this is her sewing work that's like that. Next type of line I want to talk about is called psychic line. And it's the sort of line between things. It's um, not, there's no real line or intermittent points. It's a mental connection between two elements. This usually occurs when something looks or points in a certain direction. So there's no, there is no actual line here, but it happens in like Caravaggio's painting of the Sacrifice of Isaac. Here's Abraham, thought to sacrifice Isaac. And the angel points to the ram. 
And we have another strong psychic one here. He's looking out. The knife is connected. And definitely Abraham looking at the angel. The angel looking at the ram. The ram looking back at the angel. So there's some really strong psychic lines here. But the strongest one is right here. And then that as well. This is a really, really famous one. This is a space right in between coining and there's a space. This is from Sistine Chapel, Creation of Adam. So powerful sort of psychic connection right there. Another type of line is implied line. So this is an actual line and this is an implied line. And this is also another way of doing implied line. It's created by a positioning of a series of points so that the eye tends to automatically connect them. So it could be like a dashed line, but also other ways. You'll see in the student examples there's other ways to do this, but the point is that your, your eye is connecting all these spaces to be as if it was a line there. But it's not an actual line. So is a still life with this idea happening. So the form is being defined, but there's an implied line. This may be a little bit of implied line, but maybe actually more of a gesture line because it's going across the form to define it. But there's some points of implied line in here. What are values? So in art, it means the measure of the relative lightness or darkness of something. It's important that that word relative because it's always in relationship to other values. It's an example here, the center circle of gray is the same in every block but because of what's around it it appears to be much lighter or darker so values are lightness and darkness but they have to be in relationship to what's around it so in your piece if you're trying to create value you have to pay attention to what's the lightest and the darkest the best way to do this through line there's a lot of ways to do it but you're doing this through line is hatching and cross hatching that's lines close by each other to create value. Really important with this, this project. People, when they try to do value with line, end up doing this. And they end up with these shadows that are, don't have any white in them. Just totally filled in. What's the problem with that? Well, this is a shape. That's the problem. Once you fill it in completely, it's no longer composed of lines, it's composed of shape. So that doesn't work for the project. You have to do it with the hatching. Or thickness and thinness of lines, but not through big shapes of um, value. So just remember that. This is an example of cross-hatching and hatching. Hatching is one direction cross-hatching goes like back and forth like its name implies. This is a really beautiful, this just shows you right here like a really dark black but still through line work because see how there's white, there's the obvious lines. And same in these other areas. It's a subtle difference but you need to make sure you pay attention to that. And Kathy Kollwitz is a famous portrait of hers. It's a different kind of style, self-portrait, but it still has the hatching lines in it. So it doesn't have to be architecture or portrait. It could be a lot of different things, but in different kind of roughness or carefulness of the line quality. But it's still a line to model the values. Another example of this, using more of like a one-directional sort of line, a little bit rougher, and then some line throughout it that's not modeling the value, just showing the light. Okay, volume. This is showing a volume. Volume in um, in 3D is actually real, right? So in drawing and two-dimensional design, it's the illusion of volume. Um, and you show that a lot of times by showing two sides to something. So what do I mean by that? If you have, this could be a cube. Well, it's not very perfect, but it's, but it, if we're looking straight at it and we can't see any sides to it, this could actually be a cube, but it looks like a square, right? But as soon as you actually 
let us see another side, then we have volume. Right? So you need to show multiple sides. It doesn't have to be every side. It could be, you know, this could also be a cube. I don't want to see two sides to it. But both of these have volume. This is a square. Even though I could tell you this is a cube, and it could be a cube in real life that we're looking at and trying to draw accurately. But if you can't see the other sides, you don't get volume. So this is a, you know one of the main ways to show volume. Does it have to be geometric? No. A sphere can operate the same way. But what's the difference between a circle and sphere for adding um, volume is usually some kind of value and also you know, or um, what we would call contour lines. So that kind of makes sense, hopefully, to show you the idea of volume. We'll have a couple more examples. This is a way, this is what I mean by contour lines. One directional across contour lines show volume because the lines define the surface. So even though this is a biomorphic, you know, life form that's not geometric, it's apple, these lines give us a definition of the surface by how they become convex and concave. They get tighter together where it's concave and then they spread out where it's convex and so they define the surface that way. Just another example of that cross contour um, and it's using lightness and darkness of line to make it feel a little more sublime to give the volume. And here another example hopefully you're starting to get the idea. It has a relationship to value a lot of times because if you have more density of line to show that it's um, becoming concave, then it builds up the value as well. So you kind of want to pay attention to that. But like I said, the, one of the main ways if you don't want to do value with it is this idea of things fitting inside of a crate or a box is a good way to develop almost any type of drawing, honestly. If you want to, you know, draw something, you don't know how to how to draw it. You can um, you can look at it. Obviously, find photographic reference. But another way to do it is to just start with the big geometry of it and create it. And this will actually give you um, the idea of how to build it up. So say I don't want to I want to build draw a vehicle of some sort. Well, I know it's kind of like that. I'm not looking at a picture or anything, obviously it doesn't look very realistic, but I'm doing this freehand with a computer, it doesn't work super well on this program, but you can start to build, you know, a crate, and you can build, build a vehicle, or anything you wanted to, just general shape, it fits inside the crate, these ones just fit inside the crate, but you can build the crates that are the general geometry of it. And, oops, my mouse is hitting something on my desk. And then build it up like that and just keep refining it, taking away the stuff you don't want, erasing pit, bits of it, and um, going through and changing it a bit at a time. So that's kind of the idea of creating um, as a way of inventing something, but also as a way of giving yourself volume. So hopefully that kind of helps you. This shows you that sketchy process, but the reason why I put this slide in here is because it's not geometric, but you get the sense of volume by having the crate. It tells you what's the front, what's the side, what's the top. Useful for really um, learning to and figuring out how to draw almost anything you want to draw. So I like that. I like that method a lot. It's it's a lot of fun. This is going to show you lost and found contour. So we had another type of contour, which was one directional or cross contour I just showed you that shows volume. Well, this is lost and found contour. So it's where a line is giving you the um, surface definition and it goes away and picks back up again to show that something else is blocking it out. Like the, the wave on the beach, the sand here blocks it out and then you pick it back up again. This is a great example of it as well on a, on a human form. So you lose the line here of the leg and then it comes back again here. 
you lose it there and it comes back again the different planes the one on the left is gesture and the one on the right is lost and found contour see how you pick it back up again goes here breaks away picks it back up again this is gesture over here which brings us into the idea of gesture um I want to say the definition of lost and found contour real quick. A description of form in which an object is revealed by distinct contours in some areas, whereas other edges simply vanish or dissolve into the ground, being the background. So this is showing you where certain parts just dissolve into it. And this is that great example. This edge dissolves into the background. Okay. Whereas gesture is... Line that does not stay at the edge of the form. Contour, see how these all stay at the edge? Gesture moves freely around to describe the form. Okay? It moves freely within the form. So you see this is architectural gesture. It's moving freely to define it. And in this piece, it's moving freely within the face. It's not shading, but it does create value. It's not it's not the purpose is not really to add value but it does create it so it can be used both ways at the same time but it's really about using the line to define the form see so the form of the face and clothing it's not it is you know working as value and it does have a feeling of a light source but it's not totally accurate in the light source way because that's not the purpose of it it's defining the form okay so it's kind of a can look a little tricky sometimes, but I hope it starts to make sense. This is Giacometti's way of doing it. You can see here that he's not really trying to define a light source from a particular angle, but he's defining the surface of the face, his face, by having lines freely move. So that shows you gesture really clearly there. Some student examples um, of these projects that I think are pretty good. Some of them I actually show a bad version of the student project to show you like what would be, you know, the very, very bare minimum and what would be a better one. So I'll point those out as we go along. I want to say to you, you need to pay attention to the layout of your page. I'm presuming in this that you've actually looked at the um, project sheet already, but let's just pull it up in case you haven't done that. So this is part of the project sheet. The project sheet's in the assignment as well. You need to fully look at it. The vocabulary I've been talking about is also in there, but this is the assignment part of it. On 18 by 24 drawing paper, using black marker and micron style pen, you're gonna want a pencil to rough it all out and to make sure you get it the way you want it before you ink it in a ruler. You're gonna draw um, four by five inch little rectangles that you're going to put individual compositions inside of. You're just going to design the compositions. Okay, very important. And then you're going to use black ink. It can be abstract or realistic. They don't have to be, um, they can be completely non-representational. And you're going to want, you're going to have 10 boxes and each one will show the quality of the line or the idea of, of it. Some of them are a bit more conceptual, like psychic line. And some of them are about line quality, thick and thin, wavy and angular, meandering and straight. So these ones are really a lot about the difference between the two. Actual line is the most straightforward, I believe. Implied line, and then we talked about that with the dashes. Psychic line by the connection, volume, value contrast, lost and found contour, and gesture. One concept in each composition. So. That's going to be really important. You have to label them. There's a little bit down here at the end where I talked about how you can lay out the pages, but we won't go over that quite yet. So let's go back to some student examples. I just want to say to you also, make sure you pay attention to the layout of the page. See how this is nicely laid out with even borders all the way around. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And she put the tenth one on the back of the box, the back of the page. Um, it would have probably been better if she could get all ten in in it and she could have done it if she um measured it properly but nonetheless it's a nice layout thickness and thinness this is an okay example i think some of the lines could have been even thicker in a few spots and then gone really a lot thinner 
And this is starting to do it with the way that these lines are getting really thick. They still need to have a little bit thin, really thin lines quality to be able to show it to us. And I think this really nicely shows it. It's a pretty sublime looking piece. I think you could think about this as in the difference between that's if you really want to show it you can really show it you need to have really nice thin lines and then thicker lines to really show the difference and that's why i say using a sharpie black marker and then the micron so you can get a, like a good variety this piece really does it nicely so i think this i show you the different versions to kind of show you okay this would be an a for this you know and the other ones are lesser grades to show you the kind of this is like a C, a B, an A. Okay, wavy and angular. Good work here. There's not quite enough angularity, but there's some good waviness. I think they got stuck on trying to show their little scene that they wanted to draw instead of remembering that they're trying to draw something that illustrates a concept. Too thick of a line. What I mean is that these should have been a lot more angular if they wanted to show them angularly. They got focused on it looking too much like fish instead of the idea of it being the main point. Okay? And then this too, not wavy enough. They need to be really wavy. So don't forget your idea that you're trying to show me, that you know the difference, the quality of the line, because your idea creating a scene that feels realistic to you. That's not the purpose of this, right? So this is wavy and angular, totally, um, you know, abstract, non-representational, so that works pretty well. I think some of these thick shapes are too thick. They became a little bit like sh uh, shapes of value instead of line, but nonetheless, it's good. You need to think while you're doing it about the design being interesting as well. So, you know, this one is okay, but it's interesting design. It move, your eye moves around. It's good concepts. This one's even more kind of interesting in some ways because of the diagonals. But I think they could have gotten a little more wavy and probably kept our eye into the thing by moving it around called con continuation, if you remember from the other slideshow. And this is looking pretty good waviness. The angularness, they got a little lost in it. They still needed to kind of give us some more angles. Okay. I like this piece. I think it's interesting. And they have a little, maybe need a little bit more angles, but I think it works pretty well. And um, it's interesting that they thought of doing a dress with a hanger to do it. So that was a nice piece. Meandering and straight. This shows meandering and straight, but these flowers really aren't meandering or straight. So that's kind of, um, they're not making sense. This is meandering. They could have really done these by, um, making them like continuous contour drawings that went into straight lines and the way it's broken up is kind of a bad design it's not very cohesive so you know it's passable but not the best this is showing meandering the straight it's abstract but it feels really rushed and kind of boring and you know you could do this in a few minutes it's not really doing anything design wise investigation of it this is getting better like the bricks and the other things coming coming about like that or like almost like hair or something coming off it that's getting kind of interesting could have added a couple extra lines maybe to be the mortar this is really really looking nice so okay and i think the meandering portrait's great the straight lines are awesome they could have maybe even made them more interesting straight lines by it being on a brick wall instead of just straight lines across but yeah this is really excellent work so you can see the differences there actual line this is someone's work. You know, it passes as actual line. It's kind of boring, honestly. It can be a drawing of anything, but you want it to be interesting, right? And it's boring because um, it's not the most boring, but because the angle isn't super interesting and kind of it feels a little awkward. But it works pretty well. You know, it's not bad. This is getting a lot better for an um, actual line drawing. It's all there fully and it's more interesting kind of movement diagonals. And then this one also looking really interesting for an actual line drawing, defining sort of wrinkles and different details. 
So that's really nice. Implied line. So if you remember, implied line is created by a positioning a series of points that the eye tends to automatically connect them. Well, on this, the drawings on the outside are creating points along where your eye connects. It makes the A. So it doesn't have to be just dashes, and this is a really nice version of it. It's an interesting version of it too, like a path, because our line is automatically created by these big white spaces. I think it would have been nicer if there would have been a little narrower path to feel like full line, full lines, but it works pretty well. This one was a tiny bit better, more graphic, but I like this one equally for different reasons. And then this one is really nice. Um, they got a little bit too focused on getting the skull and these values all in here. They could have done implied line throughout the whole piece by using um, lines that weren't totally connected to create some of this, but it does work especially here with what's coming out of the head. So that's nice. Psychic line, if you'll remember, is there's no actual line or intermittent points. It's a mental connection between two things. Um, usually occurs when something looks or points in a direction. Well, it's between the apple falling and the tree. They did a little bit of a motion line there. That's okay to kind of get us between it. This could have been darker in value to make it stand out. It kind of blends in a lot. This is a really good version of it. With the owl obviously looking at catching the mouse, there's a strong psychic line there. That's really nice. And then this one is also really nice, a feeling of, we know that this hand is probably going to try to catch the figure falling. And there's a sense of motion and connection between the two. So both those work really well. We could have had that with the baseball um, in the actual line one as well. Okay, so that's psychic line. Volume, you'll remember, is showing the depth or the two sides of something to give us an illusion of some amount of volume or depth. This is an okay way to do it, mountains. I think it's a little bit uh, strange how the lake or road, whatever that is, kind of breaks like that. Could have been a little nicer. The trees are a little small too. There's just things about it, the way this road line goes through too strongly you know, the clouds, but it does work as volume. I think this is a little, is very nice because it does a contour, um, cow lily, but it's maybe the placement being more of the lily or having a bit of the stem would have been nice, but it's definitely working well for volume. Um, value contrast, this is not good because all it is is I mean, it shows value contrast, but it's completely unoriginal and not very interesting. Just building up big shape to nothing, just shading a little box. So this shows me the idea, but it's you know it's not it's not good good work. So you don't want to just do that. You can do something like I said abstract, but if they're going to do something abstract, it can't be just a, a, ch a way to cheat out of really working it through. It has to still be a good design and have good craftsmanship. This is a really nice piece and see how it's all done through hatching and thickness of line. So that's really nice. And another one, this could almost be an implied line actually all at the same time. So it's value and implied line. But yeah, they really built it up through line work. See it's all line work. It's not big blocks with their sharpie. They haven't just taken their sharpie and drawn a shape and filled it in to be value because that would be not through line, that would be through shape. Another nice piece through um, hatching, like a snail shell on a table. And then this one's, you know, nice. It's like a good quality um, piece of an eye coming close. It works really well. Thicker and thinner lines as well as the hatching to do it. Oops, this one should have been with lost. In, this is lost and found contour. Um, this could also be... I don't know why I said whoops, I thought it was um, volume for a second, but yeah. This is lost and found contour. So our eye is chasing, tracing down the road, and then it breaks because of it. we have an idea of a hill, and then it goes up further. The problem with this is, see how this is a straight line right here? It doesn't need to be that straight. And these lines on it should go uh, parallel to the road edge to work properly. What do I mean? See how the line of the road is going like that? Well, these lines in the middle of it should parallel it. See, 
part to really work. So they're going in the same direction. Okay. And I think you could have done a little bit more to make it feel like it's connected a little bit better. It's getting like too narrow to too thick, but it still works really well as far as the idea is concerned. Um, some of you are going to be tempted to just copy a version of something you saw in the slideshow. Technically that's okay, but I'd like you to be a little bit more original than that. Make it your own, so just be aware of that. This is a really nice example of lost and found because it's kind of disappearing into it and then coming back again. So that's pretty beautiful. Also pretty good with value and um, shading could have been used in that sort of direction too. I like this one a lot because it gives you that idea that it's picking up, disappearing into the ground and picking back up again with the snake. It's pretty inventive. Now this one does it, but um, with the trees, but it's a little bit too angular. I think it would have been nicer if it had a little bit more of a anatomy to it. Sorry, anatomy is the wrong word. I would actually say more of like the natural biomorphic sort of form. I especially like how it goes in the antlers. It's also relying too strongly on this idea of maybe the trees, or some of it could actually have been lost and found on the actual form of the deer itself. Gesture, this is a basic gesture. It works, but it's a little bit weak. Um, there's more parts of the wolf or dog that could have used lines to define. They could have defined the eyes, um, parts of the nose more. So it's a little bit, it's more closer to a contour. It's technically a gesture, but it doesn't have quite enough lines of defining this form. This is a much better version of it. I want to say real quick here, gesture does not have to be messy necessarily. It just has to define the form of the extra lines. It usually does have a sketchy quality to it, but it doesn't have to be haphazard, I guess is what I mean by messy. It can be very intentional. You could do it a little slower. So you're going to want to go through the design process. We've talked about this before in um, the slideshow I wanted you to watch about the design process. Just want to remind you to not forget about that. One of my suggestions for you is to maybe make a little viewfinder that will help you measure out 4x5 squares to find compositions in the world around you, or magazines, or you know, actual space. If you get stuck, then this is a great way to kind of uh, change it up and get some new ideas flowing. And like I said, I showed you the assignment already. You're going to want to pay attention to how you lay out your page and get everything labeled properly. Um, just to remind you on the design uh, slideshow that says design process, I went over this idea of a live area. It's not the edge of the paper margins, but rather the outline of all the panels. Okay, so that would be the outline of everywhere where all the panels are. Let me go to the page where the beginning page where the student had their panels and tell you where the live area would be. So in this one, this is the live area right here where you get the very edge of all of them is the live area so you're going to want to define that in pencil because you don't you don't want to be able to erase it after you actually draw the borders and pin of your four by five inch squares but you want to get it all there that way all of these are square in the corner to the edge of the page and they line up really nicely. So that's the live area. That's important for you to understand. Um, I'm going to take you through, just remind you of that process of creating one. But if you haven't watched it, you really need to watch that design process um, lecture. It'll help you a lot with this. So you really need to make sure everything is square, square and well laid out and designed on the page. Tools you'll need for sure, piece of paper, 18 inch ruler, a pencil, and then you'll need a pen for afterwards. I recommend if you have it, a triangle or a T-square can be helpful to get things square. Um, a rectangular table and draft and tape. This is where you would line up things. You, get it, you would get the paper square to the edge of the table if you wanted to do it this way. Either way, you have to measure up from the edge of the page and get a line drawn on one side of it. Then on that line, measure your even borders between the two sizes. So if you know you have a live area, you need to make a certain size. Um, 
then you need to know what it would be on each side of it. What do I mean by that? They're doing a 12 inch live area on a 14 inch page. So you have 14 minus 12 is 2. They divided 2 and a half and you got an inch on each side. So their border is going to be an inch all the way all the way up this way and this way. So you need to measure those and mark them. And then you would draw, you would do it on each side, and if you had a ruler only, because you need to have two points, then you would draw from there to there to get a square live area. So on this one, it's about half an inch, because they have, they're doing 16 on 17 inch paper. So they have an inch left over, and they divided that by two. You drew it like that. See how it's okay to have them cross over each other like that? Because you're going to be erasing this. This, isn't, this is not in pen. This is for you to be able to lay out the other boxes. And you're going to complete it the other direction. So this is the same way you're going to want to draw all those little squares inside of here. Once you have the library, you can measure the 5 inches and the 4 inches and put them all in here so they're really nicely laid out. So you're going to want to make sure you give yourself enough time to do that. It, it takes a bit of time to get used to laying things out like this and measuring accurately. So I'm going to do a demonstration of that with me uh, with a little camera set up and um, I'll have a draw, piece of drawing paper and I'll be measuring it. Um, I'll post that pretty soon. I don't have a cinematographer here so I'll have to get it set up on a tripod and do my best to show you the details. But I just want to show you in a slideshow form so you can kind of see some of the details that you might not have an easy time of um, doing, seeing on the demonstration. Okay, so you need to be doing a couple things. One is looking at these different video videos, the demonstration and the lectures, and then you need to start the planning process of um, your actual ideas so you can get some compositions of your own. You have 10 compositions to make. So that's quite a bit of stuff. I want you to, you know, start using those bo discussion boards to post things so I can have a look at your ideas and compositions and give you some feedback early on, early, early on, so that you don't end up, like, inking it all and then it's not as strong or as good as it could be. If we were in class together, I'd be walking around and looking at your ideas and helping you figure them out. But I can't do that, so you've got to post. That way I can... Um, look at what you're doing online and give you the same sort of feedback, okay? So get your design process going with the compositions and the ideas, and then if you get stuck on that, why don't you just spend some time laying out the piece of paper, because you know you're going to have to have 10 of these boxes um, square to the edge of the page. And so that's kind of more like a manual, um, mechanical sort of like measuring task you could do if you get stuck on your compositional ideas. And then later on, you can come back and ink, you know, ink the pencil of the drawings and then ink the drawings inside of it. So you're going to use your pencil when you're laying things out and then ink when you finish it off, okay? You've got to have some good craftsmanship, as you saw from the examples I gave you. They're really careful in the way they do their borders and they don't have a bunch of things hanging off over the edge and paying attention to the edge of their little compositions and their line work is clean. They did this with, they laid this out with pencil first, they roughed it out, and then they did all the line work with pen and came back and finished it, right? So you don't have to do every line with pencil, but you want to have your shapes penciled out before you start adding pen so you don't make as many mistakes, okay? So this will get you started. Um, good luck and post your questions inside the module. All right, take care, guys.